In episode four, we have the pleasure of speaking with Eric Kozlowski, the head athletic trainer for the football program at the U.S. Air Force Academy. I truly enjoyed the discussion with Eric because he covered all of the key elements that made him the athletic trainer he is today, from when he was a young athlete and took that love of sport into his education and training as an athletic trainer, working in university environments, working in a high school environment, working in a professional sport environment, and ultimately finding his way to the U.S. Air Force Academy. And all along the way, Eric really talks about the importance of developing relationships and having good communication with the people in those relationships. And it's something he uses today and even to get through something like a global pandemic and how it impacts the work that he does and what he does to always put the athletes first. So I hope you enjoy our interview with Cause as he provides several positive takeaways about his educational experience and how he's developed into the professional he is today. But yeah, Eric, I wanted to talk to you about this a whole idea that I've been, I wanted to start this off of talking with some of the older gentlemen that I know, you know, about how they, how they started learning and how they, maybe they had a mentor or two that influenced them. And then now how they're trying to pass it on, because I, I think it's kind of an interesting time right now in terms of say education and even mentorship. Like I do some mentorship online with people and it, you know, sometimes it feels awkward, but everything that's happened in the last year has kind of accelerated change. And so I want to talk a bit about, you know, how you came about to be the head athletic trainer for Air Force football and what sequence of events that you went through, but also, you know, how are you guiding people now, now that you've been through all this and, and especially now with what's happening with all this distancing and virtual and, you know, what's the future going to look like and how are you preparing yourself? So those are some of the things I want to cover and, and really just want to learn more about your experience. You know, when did you know you wanted to be working as a, an athletic trainer and supporting football or in, in other sports? When did that really start for you? You know, growing up as a young guy, you know, my, my first sports experience was, was in karate. You know, my, my dad uh, was a, you know, longtime blue collar, you know, worked in uh, plumbing, heating, air conditioning, supply shop and, and, you know, just always had this big work ethic. And, um, he also on the side would judge boxing. So between golden gloves, he did a couple world championship fights with Bobby Foster. And, um, so one day we, we go to a, a boxing match and they had a, they had a karate demonstration inside there. And I, I don't, I'm trying to remember what my folks told me I'm, I might've been five or six years old. I'm like, hey, I want to do that. Anyway. So, so got in that as a young age, had, had some good mentors down there that, you know, it was fun, but they taught me how to work and they, and, they, they would uh, guide me or try to reward me in certain tournaments. And as a little guy, you know, if, if they offer you like, Hey, if you get first place to this tournament, uh, we'll, we'll get you a sweatsuit. I'm like, Hey, okay, that's cool. You know, take that as a challenge. And when the tournament's like, Hey, where's my, where's my sweatsuit? <laughs> <laughs> they were read, totally ready for it. I, I, I got pretty good at it, but moved away and, and got away from it. But when I moved to Farmington, as my dad moved on, got, got into more, more sports up in, in Farmington, New Mexico. And, you know, probably in third grade, I, I get really focused in, and loyal to a certain group. So when we moved away from the karate dojo, the Shorn Ru style that I did in Albuquerque, I, I want nothing to do with anybody else. So I started doing some other sports, basketball and baseball and football, just with the kids I grew up. I, I started meeting around the block. You know, New Mexico is a big basketball state. All of us, you know, five, 10 and under guys uh, want to play basketball there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, not many of us can, but did some other sports there, just moved along. And then you, you meet different mentors in your life, you know, from, from, you know, Roberto Duran and, and Bob Caswell were my first co- uh, karate coaches just up through, you know, my dad took on coaching as, as he did. We met some other good people and friends. You know, one guy who I just, you know, reconnect with, we're friends through high school, never spoke until about two years ago. And, you know, we, we played sports all together from the same teams from third grade till high school. And we went our separate ways. You have different coaches the guy, and the guys stick out in my mind are, um, it's, it's, it's funny because it gets a little, little more emotional now. Let me, let me pause a minute. Well, which, I mean, Eric, this is cool because somebody was asking me about, you know, who was, who were my role models. And I, and I started going back into 
when I was a child and, and, and being taken to practices and, and, you know, my, obviously my parents' involvement, but also the people that, you know, worked with me and, um, weren't necessarily what I would call like high level experts, but they were committed people. Um, and that had a huge influence on my perspective around sports, you know, as, as kind of a life choice too. So this is, I mean, this is no different than me kind of reminiscing too about all the things that happen before I even considered this as an ac- an occupation or a career. Yeah. So you, you get around and you, th- you think about, you know, a lot of our sports were, you know, through the middle schools or high school or elementaries and, and the younger groups were, were through the boys club. So I remember the smells of the boys club in that this old Quonset hut building and um, the court and going there and, and how important it was that we all had matching Converse white high tops or something. And I thought that was just a camaraderie of sport and, 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 and competing. And I, I think that's something that was something inside me was just, just to compete. And, and I think it's, it's, it's fun to compete. Uh, sometimes I take it a little too seriously and, and, and have some maybe rivals, <laughs> maybe they don't need to be rivals, you know, you, as far as Navy, you know, the Navy's a big, big, uh, competitive force against us. And you tend not to like them, but to one of my, my, my best friends and colleagues is, is just Jim Barry out there. But as you go back to your, our youth and, and meeting these people growing up and somewhere along the lines, I, I remember my dad telling me that I had a cousin or an uncle that was the athletic trainer for the Salt Lake City Gulls. Mm. I, I didn't know what it was. He said they took care of injuries and you know, got to meet him once and got me assigned baseball. And I, that's about it. That kind of stuck in my mind. And then, you know, growing up in, in this, and I think it's everywhere that in the United States or you grow up around a big school and, and they all had their big mentor, the big first athletic trainer at, at the big university there in, in, in the state. And so you start, you see articles, you hear about, you know, in at New Mexico is Toe Diem. And, you know, he's, a lot of these guys were, were World War II vets, whether they were medics or soldiers, and they just got into this, this side of it. You know, Toe was a long time head athletic trainer in New Mexico and, and so revered that with, with the state and the government and the school that he was alive and they named a building after him. He, he was still, you know, functionally with, with, with the, at the political side of things, you know, trying to raise money and things, but he was so well revered. They, they, they named the athletic complex, the football and athletic training room out of him. And I think that's, that's phenomenal nowadays that we usually wait till you pass on to, to give you a, a neat reward like that. So, you know, Toe, Toe is a, 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 a big uh, mentor of mine, you know, just spent really two, three years, a couple years after we got to know him to keep in touch. And, and, you know, Larry Willock was the head trainer. He was always a good mentor as a student. You know, Wayne Barger is another athletic trainer. You know, I, I, I had a small school partial scholarship to a division two school in New Mexico, went down there for one day and, and just didn't feel like I could do it. You know, something in my mind said, I, I don't know. I just, I didn't feel like I could play anymore or get the degree I want to at that school. Um, so I, I decided to, to leave there after a night and, and try to enroll at the university of New Mexico in the athletic training program. It was one of the first five uh, certified by the NATA program. It's, it's gone through several renditions to current time, but um I tried to get in there, but it, they weren't accepting freshmen anymore. And I hadn't, and, and that's pretty good English. Huh? The freshmen, <laughs> they, they don't, they, they weren't expect, accepting freshmen anymore. So I went back to San Juan College, uh, got my core courses out of the way, which probably was a, a blessing that I was able to take those basic classes, which could be weed out courses at a bigger university where there might be six or 700 people in a class. And I was in a 12 to 20 person classroom and really got some one-on-one attention. I think that that helped me transition into, into, into college life. You know, you, you, you go on to work as a student athletic trainer, and I, it was nothing what I expected. I mean, I didn't know what to expect really at all, but, you know, the first thing you do is, is the, the hands-on thing and, the, and the, just the, the blue-collar ethic of, of getting your hands dirty and, and helping people. And when you're, when you're young, what is it? It's tape and ankles, tape and wrist. You know, we don't know about evaluating injuries, and, and shoot, back, back then, you, we, we were barely learning how to rehab an ACL, and those kids were barely coming back. Um, you know, the, the first knee braces back in their early 80s were, were just out. So you, you learn that and you just, you just, you see the people around you and you have fun and, and that they have a passion to take care of people. You know, I could, I could use my competitiveness, you know, whether it's against you know, or, or alongside with, with some of my other students and to, to see who could take faster or who could learn, learn them think something a little bit quicker or, or be able to diagnose or, or, or call a positive test on an ACL injury or, or something like that. Or even, and, and I think we're, and that's the early thoughts. I think we're, I, I really enjoy now is the, the rehab aspect of, of an athlete, getting to know them and, and getting them to compete and competing with them and seeing what, how far you can push them. And I think in private conversations around on your Saturday show, we've talked about just get these guys to do 
to do better and, and, and challenge them. And I think especially with, with, you know, kids nowadays really got to get to know them a little bit more. I think they appreciate you and will work harder for you rather than just bossing them around a um, little, little off subject there. But, you know, it, I just have mentors all the way. I mean, there's one day, you know, Tom McLemore was a football coach, baseball coach in my high school. And I decided I wasn't going to play football anymore. And he came by the house one day with one of my buddies and said, Hey, you got to get down the weight room. You're going to play football. I'm like, not, nope, not. He goes, yeah, you are. It's like, I'm not coach. I'm done. And he kept pestering me and my buddies pestering me. He goes, give it a try. So I went down the weight room, hung out. And I, they knew once I got in, I wouldn't, I wouldn't quit. And so I, I ended up, you know, being okay, having fun with, with, with football and, 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 you know, with all the other sports in high school, it, it's guys like that. And that's not necessarily in, in always in athletic training or your career field that, that reach here, that, that provides some sort of foundation for who you're going to be, you know, and, and we can all, of course, say our parents, you know, our parents guide us and they, they ultimately set that foundation of who we are is, you know, with, with our integrity and our, our work ethic by how they, how they work and how they treat other people around them and, and how they provide. And, and, you know, I, I couldn't be more grateful for the parents that I got, but the, the coaches or mentors, whatever you want to call them that, that stick with you, you know, with Danny Boyce just being a great leader and, and teach me the, the value of strength training and, and, and how it could change your body and increase your performance. And, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for him and he's since passed on, but those guys can teach you the, the work ethic and, and commitment to, to a sport or to anything that, that I could have gone into. I think I could have been successful just by the foundation they laid. Um, why I chose athletic training, I don't know. And now that I'm older, I, I even question it even more. <laughs> like maybe, maybe there's something I could have worked, I could have not worked as hard and made more money or, but uh, I, I don't think I would have, I don't know, I don't think I'd have been able to influence as many people as I hope I have and, and help as many people as I hope to have to, you know, throughout this. And, and you still get mentors, you know, you, you read some, meet some coaches, Wayne Bachman, you know, is, is, was an old Oklahoma wrestler, USA wrestling coach and competitor five, six times in just to sit down and talk to these people and see what makes them tick kind of lights a fire in you or helps build you a little bit better and how you can communicate with people. You know, I, I, I think two things that have shaped me as an athletic trainer is when I decided to take more of a strength coach view into to athletic training, it's you know, what we're doing. We're, we're, we're trying to build strength in, in athletes. It's at a smaller level, but strength coaches are pros at it. And, and why not learn what you can, can do to an athlete and how far you can push them with, within keeping the injury safe. There's a fine line to walk from re-injuring them or, or causing, you know, causing them harm but you can also push the body a lot a lot harder than I think some of our colleagues think they can um, but just watching some of the coaches I've been around and other athletic trainers and and I, I think the the important thing we can do is is learn learn both what to do and what not to do you know how to treat people or how not to treat people through throughout our careers and I, I think those are some of the, the the better people I've been around that have, are able to synthesize that and, and move the the poor behaviors out of our lives and and, and accentuate the positives. So your, if we go back, your primary um, tr uh, training or schooling, uh, was it, it was at UNM for athletic training ultimately? Yes, sir. So I, I, I spent, I got my two years at San Juan Colleges to get those core classes out of the way. Um, it was a four-year program. I, I, with getting those out of the way, I was able to get out of there and four total years of college with three years at New Mexico. And shoot, back then, they, it was important to get the hands-on training. I still think it is. The educators in a lot of a lot of worlds don't think the hands-on training is, is a, as important as was what appears to me, and and I think the this shoot I I did I think I did 2,200 hours or 2,300 hours in three years of basically volunteering time. I I look at it now that way that I was volunteering my time. I didn't work. I was lucky enough, you know, I, I had I earned a scholarship there. You know, they paid for the tuition and books. I had family. My folks eventually got me a small apartment, a little studio apartment, um, and I'd work summertime to get me through part of the year. But you know, really. I wanted to work and I, I would give up my spring breaks. And I look back now, I'm like, you know, I, I maybe I could have things done, done things better, learn how to have a little bit more fun, but I just, I wanted to work. I would stay over Christmas. My family would end up being in Albuquerque anyway. So I would say, well, I'm just going to work over Christmas. Basketball team's working out. I want to be there. You know, spring baseball is going on. I, I, I don't want to take spring break. I want to work with the, you know, I work with the baseball team and have do some stuff there. And, you know, I, I look at our Academy guys and they're, they're so much, they're so great about handling the ups and downs. I mean, they really learn how to celebrate. They take some of the negative stuff that happens to them and they, they accept it and they, they're able to move on from it. They don't dwell on that. And, and that, that's something I wish I, I could do better. <laughs> you look back, it's like, maybe if I would have taken a spring break off, I'd know how to celebrate a little bit more I'd, or I'd understand or want to have it take a vacation, but something in me just wants to work, wants to be around the guys or help whatever team that I can. Um, you, know, you talked about me working with football and I like football, you know, grew up as a basketball fan or want to play basketball and that, that was something I'd like. And, 
but as you get on and work with other other sports, you know, my first job at, at the Air Force Academy was uh, they assigned me to soccer and wrestling. And I'd already always taken care of wrestling teams and, and had a had a love for that. But we didn't grow up playing soccer here. I mean, we knew of it, and there was a soccer league that just started as a kid, but it wasn't my thing. And but what what you get to do is you get to meet the people, and and that's who you're treating. It's you know, I could sit at a game and it was hard to watch. I try to watch them as they compete, but it was a relationship with the kids, and I wanted to help them and you know, bounce back from their injuries or get them to fight through a, a minor injury to get where they could compete on the weekend. And, um, you know, the, the sport really doesn't matter to me as long as I can uh, get to know a group and, 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 and help them. You know, the, the one thing, the soccer, whatever sport is, soccer kids, track kids, football kids, you know, whatever sport they're in, they think that's the most important thing in the world. And we have to realize that it's not, it's, you know, the, the, the soccer kids team is just as important as the football kids team. Um, it's, it's not what sport that we like as a person. It's, you know, it's their passion and that's what we're helping them there to help them, uh, help them survive and, and succeed. Well, certainly in my time spent in Albuquerque and I got some great stories for you, but, um, you know, I, I, I visited this, the university and met some people. This was like almost 10 years ago. I was there for, uh, I was working with Benicio del Toro when he was shooting Sicario and Sicario <clears throat> too. So I, I knew I had a friend who knew somebody yet in the football program. So I visited them. And then I think we, um, we did a little visit to the pit and, um, and just saw all the history and culture around that met some of the basketball people. And then Benicio's like, Oh, you went to the pit. I'd like to go there. Right. So, and then he met the head basketball coach and yeah. there was a relationship and hung out and all that. So that, it was really cool just to get the uh, vibe of that, you know, the, the influence the basketball program had and the history around that facility um, and, and was that something that kind of, kind of pulled you in as well? Yeah. I mean, I, I remember as, as a kid going to a couple games and, and back then, you know, the, the TV rights were you, you play a game and if it was away, it was live on local TV. And if it was home, it was replayed at 10. So I remember staying up late from back in the, if, you know, if you think some of these names, Michael Cooper, yeah. that played for the Lakers, it's just up for the hall of fame right now. He was, he was on a team that was really good. And they, they got upset in the first or second round of the NCAA tournament. It was much smaller then, and I don't remember the specifics, but they're ranked rather high and considered one of the final four teams. And I think they got beat by Cal State Fullerton. I could be wrong. But, um, and this was just before Lobo Gate when they about canceled the program. But um, yeah, I remember staying up and watching those games at 10 o'clock at night, watching Lobo games, and, and the names still pop in your mind. You know, Marvin Adamatic Johnson, all these guys that were just so good. And, and that's, that was what we did. And even through college, if, if, if I worked a game, football or basketball, whether we went home or we went to, to the bar to, you know, have a drink after the game, we wanted to watch the games afterwards on, on the local channel and, and hear Henry T you know, do the announcing. And yeah, so, so basketball is probably the big priority and, and having to work with some of the athletes there, uh, so many, you know, Kenny Thomas, Rob Robbins from my hometown where these guys are phenomenal. And, and they're I, just over and over all, I, they're just some of my favorite athletes ever. They're just super people. And, and to have that arena back then before they did the remodel would have, I think 18,100 was standing room only and to come down the pit and see all the people. And there was no late stragglers come to the game. That place was packed when it was, when it was tip off and, and hear the roar of the crowd and, and, and crackling your ears and, and, uh, you know, be there when you, when you beat teams, when you beat Arizona and the rank number one in the country and undefeated. And there, there's a mystique about the place and there's, there, there, it, it's still magical. And I think they're not having the success that they want, but uh, it's a phenomenal building uh, it's just so many great games against New Mexico state and overtime games and, and just outstanding how savvy the, the crowd is and how loud they are and, and how they know when to get loud, how they know when to be quiet and just their, their loyalty to their team. That's, that's their pro team. There's the basketball team. Yeah. I remember we we're there for one game and everybody had to stay standing until they scored. Right. And for whatever reason, this game, they, they, they were put, they couldn't put the ball in the hoop. So we're like standing we're like, Oh, come on, just, just score. So we can sit down and enjoy yeah. the game. Yeah. That, that's another one of their big, big deals that they've done. They've done it both when, which they've done when offense scores, they would stop. Or when, when the other team scores, they would stop. Yeah. Um, but it, it's incredible. I mean, think back to that, that, that Utah team a few years back with Majerus and all those guys, they, they, they went to the final four, you know, we beat them on a, on a Sunday afternoon in the pit on CBS TV and just, in, just incredible games. I mean, Roy Salney was one of the biggest competitors I've ever, I've ever seen. Local kid from a, from a two-way school, Hot Springs, down by Tooth of Consequences, New Mexico, southern part of the state. Gatorade Play of the Year. You thought, oh, maybe this guy's just the tokens pick up. 
I tell you, what, as, as a freshman, he got there and, I, you know, I'd be in the gym with them and they're, they're scrimmaging. Red team would be the ones and everyone else would be on the twos and, and Royce would start on the twos and wh whichever team that dude was on was winning. The other team could have the blue chippers or whoever they were, the 6'8", 6'10", guys. And Royce at 6'1", 6'2", white kid was just such a leader. And, and, and you know, that, that's where you learn some of your stuff from the kids too. He would just fight and scratch and he'd bring the white team back and, and the coach at that time would, would flip them over and put them on the red team and the red team would come storm them back. And I remember him coming over to me saying, and I'm, <laughs> he's saying, cause I, I, I can't redshirt this kid. I got to play him. I, I plan on redshirting him. And he, and he did. And, and he, he, he was super. So many guys, I don't want to forget anybody. They're probably not listening anyway, but I, <laughs> those guys were, were phenomenal. So the, the, the period between finishing at UNM and then, you know, what happened between that and Air Force Academy? What, what kind of stops did you have? What kind of mentors did you have and influences? Uh, my, my, my first job out of, out of New Mexico, it was, um, it was 1989 the year I graduated. And uh, there's some local jobs, high school jobs available. You know, I, I knew I wasn't sure of GA positions and, and I didn't really apply anything there, um, but took a job at, at Santa Fe High School. They had just transitioned their their football or their high school from one high school to two high schools. Now they're Santa Fe High and Capital High School, and so there's very little football players. We I think we 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 had less than forty kids for freshman JV and varsity football. This is a team who beat my high school team as a senior, that kind of knocked us out of the chance of being the playoffs. And they'd won a state title since then, and they were they were competitive. And when they separated the schools, they weren't quite as competitive. Um, but if you think of the mentors there. Um, I remember getting a phone call in the athletic training room and this, this woman answered, said, Hey, is this Eric? I said, yep. Is this Mary, Mary Ann Erickson? I'm at the athletic train at the Capitol high school. I'd like to meet you. And, you know, she, she was great. You know, we, we become friends and you kind of lose contact. And, and just by, by chance or divine luck, we reconnected a couple of weeks ago because I saw her name and her picture in an Instagram post. You know, we worked rather closely there for four years at, at, uh, at in the Santa Fe public school system. Uh, during that time, I decided I, might want to try pro sports. So I, um, that was when the major league baseball was, was transferring all, they wanted all certified athletic trainers instead of the non-certifieds that they had in, in their minor leagues and, and, and the major leagues, uh, applied. I had my first computer at that time. The school provider was an Apple two C learned how to make a database and, and sent off letters to every major league baseball team, which is, you know, didn't get any replies, which just seemed like the story of my life. And I, not only my life, I think a lot of people apply for jobs and never get, a word back saying, Hey, sorry, anything. And then it's, it's just not me, but uh, didn't get any reply. A little bit later, the Texas Rangers uh, called back and said, Hey, we'd like to have you. Do you want to come to Port Charlotte work for our rookie league? I said, why not? So I, <laughs> I was, I was off, you know, it was summertime anyway, and, and spent a, uh, a summer down there and got in a little bit of August and missed a little bit of football at the start, but had a good time with, with a couple of those people and, you know, had, had a great manager and, and to spend time in the clubhouse really, you know, the, those guys taught me some things too about, you know, I remember the, the manager telling me, cause if, if a guy doesn't want to, guy didn't want to work to do the rehab, he's only hurting himself. Just communicate with us. Let us know what he's doing. You know, it, it's not on you. It's on the guy to get himself better. And, and I think that that's great when you, when, if you're lucky enough to have a, a, a coach and players that understand that you'll have good success. If there's, there's some coaches that believe that everything falls on the athletic trainer to if a kid's not performing, it's it's the trainer's fault. If a kid's not getting into the rehab room, it might be the athletic trainer's fault. And 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 maybe it is. Maybe there's there's some other conflict there. But in general, the the, the athletes, the coaches, the strength coaches, the speed coaches, the athletic trainers that want to compete and want to succeed are going to have success, and they're going to they're going to hold themselves accountable for for their job and 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 make themselves the person they want to be. Yeah, and, and I talk a lot about like even with my last talk with the. Uh... Uh, Bob Alejo we're talking about okay well what opportunities do people have can they uh, work in a pro environment a college environment and, and even the high school and what were some of the differences that you got or, or some of the benefits out of working in a high school environment versus you know now you're working with pro athletes and and, and how did that sort of help you having that mix you know the the high school was was great because you got I, I was allowed some privilege of, of taking care of a team by myself and they were still a certified athletic trainer over me. They, they gave me some privilege at, at New Mexico to, to travel with the team or to really be in the practice room and, and have some good one-on-one -on -one experience while I was in college. And that's more of the norm, you know, since then. Um, but the first job, you know, there were 630 athletes 
and I was the only athletic trainer and I had to take care of them all from the paperwork, the injury track in and, you know, practicing game coverage. And, you know, you realize you, you, one person cannot do that perfectly by themselves, but you have buy-in from an athletic director who says, okay, here's what I expect out of you. You take care of the football teams. Next, you take care of home events. Beyond that, you can do what you want. So if, if wrestling's traveling on a Wednesday night and there's no games, I could go with the wrestling team to, to Española for a dual match, which is just as raucous as a, as a basketball game in Northern New Mexico. Um, and, you know, meet some local PTs at the high school level that, that wanted to, me to come to their, their shop and, and just meet them and see what they did. Again, just out of the blue, I, you know, out of their kindness and, you know, them loaning me an ultrasound machine or a STEM machine and, and just always there if I, if I had a question or you need some help. Um, and then moving on to the pro level, you know, the biggest difference was, you know, that I, I got sidetracked here. Right? So when, when we get there, like, you know, I, I think you're able to track me, but so when we started playing, we shared our locker room with the Blue Jays. Uh, well, the Rangers weren't very good back then. Uh, George W. Bush owned them then, got to meet him. I didn't know who he was other than the owner and, you know, realized, you know, it's pretty cool. He turned out to be the president later on, but met him. And while I was there, they were thinking about being sold, but the Rangers were a, a dry team at that time. So no, no beer, nothing in, in, in the, in the uh, locker rooms or the, the clubhouse as they call it back in baseball. <laughs> we shared a locker room with the Toronto Blue Jays who were Labatt sponsored. So you get to know those guys and, and their equipment guy, you know, they would, you know, we'd go on a road trip and our road trips back then were, you know, we'd come to the, come to the, the field, warm up for a little bit. And at 12, we'd either warm up for the game that starts at one in the afternoon or we travel. The most we travel is 45 minutes to, to Sarasota or, or um, down to uh, Fort Myers. So it's all day trips. We're always back by 3, 4, 30, 4, 4, 30, and we're done for the day. But uh, the, the Blue Jays equipment manager would say, is there anything I do for it? He's like, no, we're good. We'll see you a little bit. He goes, how about I leave you a little bit of beer in the locker room? So I checked with the, the, the manager. The manager was fine with it, and I'd come back, and there'd be a, a small cooler with some uh, Labatt's, Labatt's Blue in there for me after the game. And I tell you, in Florida heat, that, that sure tasted good back then. <laughs> uh, if, if, if we talk about sports and how they care for their athletes overall and how – how I think teams can find success. The Rangers weren't having success back then. They've since found it. But even at the rookie league level, we would come in and they'd have, they'd roll out an old equipment trunk in the middle of the room, throw a couple loaves of bread out there and throw some peanut butter and jelly, maybe some tuna fish and some uh, tongue depressors. And that was the guy's lunch. And sharing the building with, with the Blue Jays, they had a whole locker room just full of gear where they took care of toiletries for their guys, how they did their laundry. And um, they'd have hot soups for them and, and, and sandwich bar and, and for their rookie league team. And that's back when, when Toronto was having success in the, in the early nineties. And I don't know if you follow them or if that's your team, but the you know, guy from my high school, Dwayne Ward was the, was the closer for that team that set some records. He was with the Braves and he went with them when they were really good. And he, he pitched a lot of innings and, and won a lot of games as their closer. And, you know, again, that, that guy was a, a competitive SOB also. He was pretty tough. Um, but I think, I guess that's the things that kind of mold you. You see how you, the better you treat people, the more that they're going to compete, the more they want to be around and, and, and contribute to the, to the program as a whole. You know, we, we did a pretty good experiment and it was, it was on the club, it wasn't on me, but they, they wanted me to put the kids through, the pitchers through a, a, a shoulder maintenance program. So I'd, every day we'd walk through and, and get them through this mode. I'd walk them all through and we'd all do these exercises together. And about halfway through, I, as I learned later as a test, he said, stop doing it. Manager said, stop doing that for him. I'm like, all right. And I said, well, why don't you want me to do it? And he said, well, we're gonna find out who wants to be here. And it was down the line that the kids that kept doing the exercises had much less shoulder problems than the kids who stopped doing them. And they, they, they're trying to teach these guys how to be pros. I mean, those poor kids weren't making $800 a month. And, you know, we had a kid come back, get sun, sunburned and got fined. And, you know, when you get fined 80 bucks, that's a pretty healthy fine when you're only making, you know, $800 a month. But uh, it, I think that, that's some of the, the mentorship things I picked up along the way or how to treat people or how to, how to reach, really reach people to get them to, to become their best. Um, I, I didn't stay on with the Rangers. They were talking about being sold. They told me they wanted me to stay. And I, I felt that I had to make a certain amount of money to stay compared to what I was making. Ties. It wasn't great money either way, but I just had a number that I felt, okay, if I make this money, I can supplement it with a job in the summertime and still live comfortably. And maybe I can progress and make better money down the road with this organization. At that time, they said, we're not getting anybody more than 11% raise. They gave me 11% raise and it. It was enough to, to convince me to stay with the, with the team. So I went back to the high school, started looking into graduate positions. You know, lucky for me, one came up in New Mexico and there are two slots and they offered to me and another guy that I, I was uh, familiar with as an undergrad, Mike McMillan. Good for me because my folks moved back. I didn't have to worry about room and board as I was, was a GA and got, you know, got, got a pretty good pay cut, but 
when you got room and board mostly taken care of, it, it wasn't much of a pay cut at all. So I was able to save some money and move towards getting into a house. During that time, there's a head, head athletic trainer turnover. Um, I applied for assistant position, got the assistant position, was also, uh, at that point, the assistant athletic trainers were off to be the curriculum directors. So they said, well, yep, you, you're six years out of school. We want you to be the assistant athletic trainer, take care of, you know, whatever sports we want you to, but also be in charge of this academic program. I'm like, okay, I guess I can do that. There's a drawing board. <laughs> I'll do my best at it. And it, it wasn't easy. And, and, you know, again, you find some mentors in, in the academic area, you know, with the University of New Mexico was a teaching hospital. So I'd, I'd ask some of the instructors there, how, how do you, how do you better instruct? How do we get better results or how do we make our kids more knowledgeable or, or, or challenge them better to, to make them succeed in this career? I lasted about three years and uh, didn't, didn't, just didn't like the setting as much anymore and decided to stop and, and was out of work for about four months. And uh, Air Force Academy had, had a emergency hire come open by then Larry Willock, who's the whole death, head athletic trainer in Mexico was the head athletic trainer um, at Air Force. And he had just taken over for, for Jim Convoy, who was at Air Force since the beginning, since day one. And um, he passed on. So that's how they had the emergency hire. And I got, I got pulled up there and, and uh, I, I took the job and moved up. And that's uh, November of 98 and, and haven't left yet. Um, I was first hired for, for three weekends, contract only. Um, I didn't feel it right that I was going to jump on a bus and not know any of these wrestling team or wrestling player or, or rest, wrestlers or the coach. So I decided, you know, come into work a little bit and just meet them. What much I could do because I wasn't on contract, which wasn't really allowed to touch anybody at that time. But at least they could see my face and know who I was when I got on the bus. They didn't say, who the heck is this guy? A month or two later, they offered me a full-time position, and, and I took that. And that's when I first saw on the road, wrestling at, at the academy. It was no frills. We were on the bus a lot, and it wasn't uncommon to take a 12-hour bus trip. They didn't fly many places, unless it was East Coast or Chicago. But you know, if we if we were going to Norman, Oklahoma for the, the Thanksgiving Open on the Saturday after Thanksgiving, we were getting on a bus at 8 o'clock at night, Thanksgiving night, and 12 hours on a bus overnight, getting up and getting off the bus and going right to the, the wrestling room and practicing. And uh, it, we did that for many years <laughs> in a row. That was, was a little bit of a grind. And how was that transition? You're going from, um, you know, working at UNM and then now you're at an academy position. Like, um, how was that adjustment? Was there much of an adjustment? Were there people there to kind of tell you, okay, this is how it's done here. This is, this is the Air Force way. Was that, was that a smooth transition for you? I, I think it was fine because they, they let us be our own professional. You know, there's some guidelines and they have they, this guidelines being become a little bit more stricter as time's gone on, but I, I think it's good that you mentioned that. That's one thing that I did miss. And maybe it's more of a product of being a, a curriculum program or educating students that everybody did a lot of things the same. You know, we taped the same, a lot of the treatments were the same. So that was fun. It was a little at the Air Force Academy. There's, there's written protocols for injury rehabs and, and that, that we, we all, most of us try to follow. But um, as far as day-to-day -day things, everybody does their own thing. I can say that both mostly positively, you know, we have, we're able to be our own thinkers. Um, we're able to learn from other people around us. And, and, it, and same thing like we talked about earlier, both learn what to do and what not to do by people around us. There's no real set guidelines. Uh, the, the biggest transition was that it, we, I went from a, a salary employee who in the athletic training field, you're there, especially during, you know, if it's football season, you're there from, shoot, I don't know, six in the morning sometimes till 7, 38 at night, um, sometimes later during two days, sometimes earlier. We're at the Air Force, at first, excuse me, at the Air Force Academy, we're, we're government employees, GS employees, and we're hourly wages. So in, they don't necessarily want us to go into the overtime area when we, when we don't have to, which, which is okay. So it's, it's taught us to have a, that in athletic training, you can have a better lifestyle. You don't have to be at your job just to be, be there, you know, be there when there's something to be done, be there when, when, when you need to be there. But if, if there's no athletes at the place and you can take some time off or get away, then, then get away. Um, a lot, a lot of people in, in, in many fields feel they're, they're the hardest working person just because they're there at seven in the morning, they leave at seven at night, but they don't always accomplish as much. So it's what you can accomplish during your work time that I think is most important. I think that's been a, a valuable lesson that uh, I often thought if I left the Air, Air Force Academy, now here we are 20, 23 years later, but I, I think that you could institute and, and, and give people a, a better quality of life by letting them have a little more time off and not, not just have to be at work just to, just to be there. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear that a lot in terms of, you know, both sides. One, you know, I'm putting in this many hours and I'm dedicated to my job, whereas 
some of the best leaders that I've, I've heard about will, will tell their employees, like, you know, you go home, come on. We want to have well-rounded employees here. We want to have uh, people who are happy in their life, uh, also away from the work as well. So I, that's a common theme, and it, it doesn't have to really negatively affect productivity at all. Now, I know I met you about four years ago, um, and I'm good friends with Coach Matt McGettigan. Like, how are you guys working with each other to kind of teach each other? And then how are both of you guys working with the staff beneath you and maybe the, the graduate assistants and whoever interns to educate them on, you know, your sort of joint synergy and, and knowledge that you can pass back and forth between departments? You know, th- thanks for bringing that up. And, and, and Matt, I think that's been a, an important part of my career also. And, and it, the relationship that an athletic trainer has with, with the strength coach, I think is probably the best relationship you can have. You know, just aside from, from your colleagues and your, and, and your coworkers that you, that you believe in and want to work with. Mark Paulson the head, was the head strength coach in New Mexico many years ago, and he was phenomenal. And I, I don't remember Diana's last name. She could have been 5'2", five, five, 105 pounds, and she was just tough as nails. And just through communication between the two staffs, you know, there's, I saw, I saw a quote, I think it might have been Boyle last night that quoted somebody saying, you can't throw the, the baby out with the bathwater. So you can't, if there's an injury, you, you got to train around as much as you can. You can't shut a guy down just because they're injured. So you can, you can push a body part or the rest of the body as long as you're protecting the, the injured part. And so with, with open communication with the strength staff, you know, we, I built that relationship with, with, uh, with Diana and Mark in New Mexico. And I had no problem saying, hey, here's, can you work around this in the weight room? They're like, absolutely. And they never hurt anybody in the weight room. You know, it, it, it was super. And, and then so coming back here and, and having the same relationship with some of the strength coaches I've worked with, uh, you know, Drew Bodette's the one I worked with, with, with hockey, or he works hockey and wrestling, but back when I was doing wrestling, he was super in the, in the same manner. Um, Kim Pinsky helped with wrestling for a little bit and same thing. I could give him some guidelines and had no worry about them becoming injured in the weight room, and, but then still getting a quality workout in the weight room and conditioning aspect of it. And I, I think those open lines of communication are, are, are important. And um, Matt McGettigan's, you know, become a great friend, a, a, a mentor, and and just keeping open lines of communication. And and I, I've, I've gone to athletic trainer conferences, and and sometimes that's a an area where there's some headbutting between the strength coach and, and the athletic training department. And as far as I'm concerned, we're all the sports medicine team, or we're all sports development, whatever you want to call it. We all have one goal: that's to make better athletes better, stronger, prevent injuries. And you know, these people will ask, like, well, how do you how do you develop that relationship, or how do you get along with the strength coach? And I, I got to raise my hand every time and say, you walk down there and you talk to them. You talk to them face to face and, and get to know them and, and let them know what your goals are and how we can help each other in, in making these athletes better. And that, that's what I've done with Matt. You know, we, we, before I was a little bit more in charge of, of the football team when I was the, you know, an assistant with football, you know, we would talk about things and, and get to know each other there. And, and he would help me with some rehabs with some young guys and, and, uh, and to this day, he still does. And we, we talk every day. We go to our football staff meeting and, and we walk down the hall and, and devise our plan of how we're going to, to train the kids that day. And, and, and it's just, I'm just extremely lucky, blessed, whatever you want to call it, to have, have Matt on staff. And there's no doubt that I put a guy in the weight room and between he and his, the, the young guys, his assistants and interns he's had in there, you're absolutely right. I, I often, I try to talk to them the same way I do Matt or you know, we'll go through and, and have our own little learning session. Those five guys and me, and I'll, I'll ask them, how do I help you grade a squat? You know, teach me about a deadlift. I have no idea about a deadlift. And they can explain that, and then I'll explain the rehab side of it or what I'm trying to get on the rehab part of it. And I think that's super nice. And I tell all these guys, as, as, as you leave the academy, you go on somewhere else, to be open to develop, to, to develop that relationship with an athletic trainer and, and set some goals together about making teams better and, and preventing injuries and, 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 and work as one, as a unit. And our, our football staff, you know, we're NCAA guys just that we've got to be at every conditioning session. You know, we, we feel like as a staff, we got to be in the weight room also. And now it started back when, when Matt McGettigan was a one man, one man show with maybe one intern. And I just want to give him more help. So I would be in the weight room a lot and we'd, we'd be there. And, and, and if I didn't understand something, I'd call Matt over and say, Matt, I don't know what, what this guy's doing and I don't have a way to articulate it, but watch his next reps for us and teach me and teach him how to do it better. And, and, you know, that's in the middle of a training session. That kind of guy Matt is, you know, there's a lot of guys would have said, Hey, don't bother me with that stuff right now. But when, when a guy understands he wants to help his athlete become the best guy he can, you know, that that's Matt McGettigan. And, and, and he's, he's always teaching, whether it's teaching a, a, an athlete, the proper t- technique on lifting or the program or, or an athletic trainer like me, how to be, how to, how to be a better 
spot or a judge of, of a guy's technique or maybe what workload you can give give to a guy to to advance them on and I think it's 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 probably the, the best relationship you can have you know you got got to learn your coaches your head coaches but you know in, in football especially they're usually off recruiting during the spring and it's Matt me and Ernie and Derek and Mark and Jess that are around those are the other athletic trainers with me and Jonathan and Will and, and they're the two main assistants at football and that's who's with the guys all spring long and we really got to learn to trust each other and and so much so guys have been sent out of a lift. You know, there's a lot of times I know, you know, some coach might say, I'll oh, just lift through it. It'll be, you'll be all right. Or go see the athletic trainer afterwards. And they're, they're able to decide through our conversations of when a guy should stop a lift, what pain level or what motion, uh, what kind of things would cause pain. And they'll bring a kid up in the middle of a, a session and say, hey, this guy's having these symptoms. Would you mind taking a look at him and let us know what they can do in the weight room? So I'm, 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 I'm tremendously blessed with, with, with Matt McGettigan. Yeah, that, that, no, relation, <laughs> that, that relationship. Uh sounds like it's imperative for you guys to have success. And uh, I know when I was working uh, in the university environment that sometimes, you know, the athlete would come with the training program that we, that I put together. And then all the athletic training staff would do is just cross out the exercises they didn't want them to do without any real discussion of the, the granularity of that exercise and how we could modify it and all that. So that was a bit frustrating, but it sounds like the strength of that relationship and you being there really makes it you know, a lot more, um, I guess, supportive for the athlete and a lot more productive. And, you know, there was an article last week um, that I went through uh, in The Athletic and it was called The Blame Game about NFL injuries and like, who do we blame? Like, is it the medical staff? Can we, you know, should they be blamed for it? And when you boil it down, it's everybody's responsibility, right? Whether it's how people practice or, you know, the length of practice, the volume of practice, what happens with the strength coaches, obviously what happens with return to play and how you, you know, get involved with those different, uh, you know, actors and say like, Hey, we got to work together. Maybe it's a combination of what all of us are doing that we can improve. And is that what you're finding is that you have to have those alliances within the team, within the staff, within the department, within the, you know, within the organization to make all of this better. It's not just one person that's going to make a change. Right. No, no doubt. Nobody likes to see a big red, red X on their homework, right? So, I mean, how much easier is it just to walk down and say, hey, here's what I'm trying to accomplish with this guy. And here's why I don't think they should do that exercise. What other exercise do you think might be better in this area? And there's times, you know, it's an early post-op kids, like, oh, there's something we just can't do on this part. Let's wait till we get motion back or whatever it is. And, and they're respectful of that. But I, I think they're, they're also respectful on, on the backside when we're in the weight room with them every day and a kid's rehabbing and maybe starting to do some strength training with the body part and one strength coach can come say, Hey, cause this guy thinks he can do a little bit more. What do you think? You know, me or one of the, the other football athletic trainer staff mem- members can come over and, and evaluate with the kid on the fly and say, okay, yeah, I think you're doing great. You know, you're pushing this amount of weight. I think we can add more weight to this or you're pain free. Your motion looks good. Your technique's great. Move on. And, and, and I, I tell you the, the, it's not a secret. I, I've told some of the athletes and they often don't understand why I do it. And I, maybe other people don't do it. There's a kid that's still rehabbing, but then he's built strength. I give them the strength coaches and they may be doing the same exact exercise that I'm doing, or they may be doing what I recommend or a collaborative effort of what we can do in the, in the weight room environment. But an athlete, when they got the coach with the whistle and the strength coach with the deep voice, and it's a training session around their buddies, it's not one-on-one with the athletic trainer where maybe they feel protected or that they're still, still getting better, but they're in the weight room with their athletes, with the strength coach, their mindset changes. And that, that's, that's when I see guys really excel and really starting to build strength. And it's, it's always within a safe guideline of us. I'm not saying we're, I mean, I think some of my people I've talked to think I'm a little bit of a savage with some of the stuff that I do in, in that manner, but it's, it's all safely planned and, and, and coordinated with, with the strength coach. You know, whether it's running, if we, we put them through a running program from, from our alter G and to the treadmill, to the curve. And when we feel they're ready to run on dry land or maybe run them a day or two, and I'm like, all right, you're going to run a Getty tomorrow. Like, whoa, you think I'm ready to run with Getty? He's like, heck yeah, I do. That's why I'm going out there. And then Getty and I are talking. He's like, what do you want me to do today, Cause? Warm them up. Put them through your warm-up. I think that's all safe. Let's do some linear stuff. You know, seven out of 10. And we learn to speak the same lingo between me, the athletes, Getty. You know, if it's 70%, some people say seven out of 10. We all speak the same language. And I think that helps the athlete. And the athlete will think he has a great day with Getty. And he just had a rehab day with strength coach. But in his mind, he's getting better. His body's feeling better. And, and we're, we're making some, some great improvements with that. And this hasn't changed, really, like as we go forward here. And I know we've had 
deep discussions about COVID and the precautions you've had to take. And, and I'm hoping we're, we're looking at a, um, you know, a gradual end to a lot of this as the vaccines get rolled out. And, um, but are you going to change anything? Have you learned anything? Is there anything you're going to do different or is it just really keep, you know, working on these relationships and, 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 you know, some things will change in terms of, you know, maybe the tool you use, but, but the relationships seem to be really important for what you do. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't believe that the relationships will change. I, I think that's, that's super important. You got to keep pressing there. The distance of which you talk in relationships may change a little bit, or maybe it's a different habit. It, I think the, the best thing, both being on the, the, on the talks with, with you before and, and, just calling around and talking to old colleagues, maybe having her send them somebody a text in the athletic training world at the beginning of all this is that the thing you realize it, it, it really feels like you're going at it by yourself. You know, I know that our athletic training staff worked really hard to, to, to be organized and, and do what's best. You know, we've always got a lean medically side, you know, we're definitely a sports program, but you know, our guidance comes from the medical side and we're always going to lean the, the, to best protect the athlete from that side. But also, you know, in, in our athletic training world, it's also the, um, we got to be a little bit rational of, of what's also safe and how can we safely do this and what's, what's reasonable and what, and, and managing expectations, which is a lot of what we do as athletic trainers also is managing athletes expectations or coaches expectations. Also, it was a big stressor on a lot of us. And, and just to call around and talk to colleagues and, and friends in, in other places. And the same thing was said, just like we said on some of your previous podcasts is, is you're not alone. We're all going through this. I've had the same exact experience. There's pushback here. There's support here. There's no support there. There's fake support in this other place, but we all went through it and it was exhausting. And I, I you know, you can feel sorry for us. And it, it took me a couple of weeks after the season was over to kind of feel like my, my nervous system was getting back to normal. But, but think about the, the, the kids that were testing. And, and even if you're an, an NBA guy or NFL guy testing every single day, you know, if you're in a bubble, you know, you're probably pretty safe. You know, if you're doing the right thing, you know you're safe, but we can't always expect them to do exactly what we want them. They're going to go have, have dinner with friends or they're going to go see friends at other place or whatever. And that, that's just reality. But at, I feel for our guys, and, you know, I, I can't really speak for other schools, but I, gotta, I know they're the same. They got to be the same. But you're, we tested three times a week. And can you imagine as an athlete, you, you test a Monday morning and you don't know what the heck's gonna, your life's going to be like for the next two weeks until Tuesday morning? And it could be that the text you get to your phone or the email you get at 3.30 in the morning telling you you're positive. And in and, and our system, sometimes the guys who were, who were positive were delayed or they retest them so we didn't get their results till later in the morning. I mean, that's a lot of anxiety on, on, a, on a college athlete that's already worried about, you know, especially at our place, about, about their academics and about being a successful football player. And then you throw on this thing, this COVID and, and the, the testing and the, and the parameters and the guidelines for how long you got to sit out afterwards, you know, these... Some of our seniors, they knew they were only going to play eight games, and then it was down to five. And then we, you know, were able to get Army back in, so they played six games. You could lose, you know, a quarter of that just by being contact traced, by being next to somebody who was positive. You know, and there were guys who who, who said, "Cause I did everything perfect. I have been in my room for the last two weeks, going to this last game, and the day that we're getting ready to leave, he tests positive. And this poor kid's got to stay a senior away from our our, our football team at Army." And then has to stay in the, in the dorms until December 27th. I mean, it 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 was hard on us all, and it's hard on them when them when they had to live, live through it, and when they had to stay isolated in their room for for uh, 14 days in a row or 10 days in a row or whatever it was, and hard on us trying to figure out how we're going to get return guys to play. We went from hoping we'd have a week to return them to gradually progress them during practice to the week that they returned. It worked out. We didn't have any big problems. You know, I knew our guys would always tell us that they're feeling good. We knew guys we talked about earlier that would say, I'm not going to tell you if I have symptoms. And we knew that. that that's part of athletes. They don't want to admit weaknesses or they don't want to have to miss a game. That, that's no different. And, and in some ways, the, the disease was, was no more different than when we had uh, norovirus going through the, the team before. Or we have a, another bug going through the team. It, in our close proximity, it just runs through a team. It'll run through a meeting room. We just try to protect them as much as, much as we could. And you know, we'd return guys back and they'd say, yep, I feel great. And we'd monitor their, their minutes every day of practice. We'd progress them back a little, a few more minutes every, every day. And, you know, I spent more, I'm always at the practice field, but maybe more time closer to those guys watching them than I would a regular injury kid, just seeing how they, how they responded, how they were breathing. And, and I, I'd see guys come back and they were really labored breathing and just that big, deep breathing. When you see their neck really struggling in to, to move, to move air. And you, you'd ask them, it's like, I'm doing fine. 
you know, they, they weren't doing fine for, for two weeks later. And then when it's all done, they'll, they'll tell you the truth later. It's like, yeah, I don't want to tell you, but man, it took me two, three weeks to get my lungs back. You know, the, the, the uh, two weeks off for the uh, contact tracer back, you know, they, it's since changed for the uh, positive tester, but um, guys have come back and heck yeah, their bodies and legs were fresh, but it didn't take long to get back into camp soreness. And, and they were sore for, you know, up to a week or two afterwards, so they really got feeling, feeling good again. So it, 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 it was a struggle. It was a struggle, Derek. Yeah. And uh, like you said, I think having that ability to text or pick up the phone and call somebody that's in a similar situation and share stories and, and, and maybe strategies or even just have somebody to lean on from a mental health perspective is all important. And, that, you know, this is, again, something that we talked about with Bob Alejo was just, you know, make sure that you have that network and reach out to people and, and establish, you know, a, a team of peers and colleagues that you can, you know, lean on. And, and so, you know, if people want to get in touch with you, Eric, what are some of the ways that they can do that through social media and all that? What are, what are some locations that I can send them? Yeah. Let me, let me say one more thing. If I think, I think you're, you're right. Reach out to other people. Um, and I think out is important. If, if there's a colleague that you like that you work with next to you, that then kind of kind of spin you out of control a little more or you're, you're commiserating and you feel the same pain and it's okay to talk about it and you're like okay we're both going through this but when you spread it out a little further i think it it, it it's more helpful to, to share your thoughts with other people and not share with us it whether it's you know a state away or a college up the road or whatever it is i think that's more important than, than within your own close-knit team of, of the, that's of athletic trainers or team physicians or whoever it is um I'm thinking my, my Twitter handles at Eric cause E R I C K K O Z. I usually just read there, get some news. And, and I think it's, that's a great place to get some follow other colleagues and see what they're doing and, and, and get some good advice on, on that line and, and DM on them. And everyone's really, really friendly and, and open to share there. And, and uh, my Instagram is at E J K O Z at E J cause. And I put a little more pictures of things that I, you know, I like to do on the sideline. Um, I like to cook a lot. You know, I, I like to test some different bourbons or different tequilas on there. Um, I'm, my recent hobby is, is I'm getting into his ham radio and, and I've got my technician license in there. So my own radio stations, my call sign is KE zero SMR. And that's pretty fun, a different way to reach out and, and meet some people. And I'm, I'm not the most social person about meeting people. But it's, <laughs> it's okay to get out there and, and talk on the radio and learn some, and have a means of, of uh, emergency communication should you need it. And, and here's some different folks ideas. And it's a, it's a pretty good network I've, I've enjoyed. That's awesome. And, and you, like you said before, you're, you're tight with the, the guys at the other academies, uh, your counterparts. More with the Navy guys, the, the trainer there, Jim, Jim Barry was much like I was, we were both wrestling athletic trainers. Um, we're assistant to the football team. He's since been elevated to be the head football athletic trainer and head, head athletic trainer overall. So, he's got a whole different level of stress than, than I can even imagine having to deal with all the teams and how they're going to play. Cause it, 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 it really does seem people have lost their mind, but the bottom line coaches want to have their kids participate in sports and coaches talk about giving their kids the best experience and, and getting them to getting to, for them to compete. Uh, what they have a hard time understanding is these are different times and, and, and it, this, this virus is dangerous. Um, there's ways to prevent it. And if you can mitigate where you can, you know, do the best you can with it. And, uh, but it, it's pretty difficult. And, you know, we're lucky enough as our medical staff, we got our first vaccine on Monday. Um, I'm hopeful for that. I think that's going to help our, help us get over this. And, but it's uh, definitely a little bit worrisome time with how, how quickly this, this bug can, can, can be spread. Yeah. Well, certainly thank you for the time, Eric. Um, you know, I know it, it's been busy for you, but I don't want to take much more of your time. I know there's some football to be watched today. So thanks again. And I really enjoy, you know, talking about these types of things with you and getting you on our zoom pop calls as well you you always have something really useful and very insightful to add to the to the conversation right i appreciate you guys having me on and it's it's good to have some new followers that are not followers but people that i follow both as strength coaches and speed coaches and, and learn their techniques and you know i, I think one of the best things that, that you've helped me with is is the hashtag that got to kind of make the hashtag when we're teaching guys how to run and uh it's it's been helpful if I'm on the side rehabbing somebody and, and get a veto of them running and say, here's what you got to do. And they don't quite get it. And I can throw the hashtag on there and they're like, all right, I get it. 
Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's all I want. I want something simple and easy. And yeah. if I don't have to talk, then great. So thank you once again, Eric. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. 